Since time immemorial, man has looked to the stars. We've wondered what could exist in the outer spheres of space. In our arrogance, we believe to have discovered all there is on this planet. But in reality, we only scratched the surface. We failed to look deeper. For our oceans contain such vast and diverse life, it might as well be a different world. Deep in the waters, where not even the light can reach, we find creatures who have evolved in such a way their civilization could rival humanity. These creatures have made the cove and the waters around the hamlet their territory, attacking trade ships and depriving the town of necessary supplies. It falls to us to drive these fiends back to their dark, brackish waters. The pelagic creatures, or as they're more commonly known, the sea folk, are a race of fish-like people who have made the cove their domain. But this isn't their first time ashore. The architecture in the cove hints that they have been here before, perhaps centuries ago. And more recently, our ancestor once made a pact with them. The excavation and his various schemes drained his coffers. In financial desperation, he sought out the sea folk, looking to make a deal and replenish his wealth. Their demands were an obscure idol and a sacrifice to be delivered under the blood moon. The ancestor agreed, and as he walked away, he caught a glimpse of a familiar waif, one who had been following him throughout the years and had seen his more disturbing activities. It was then the idea creeped into his mind. What better way to kill two birds with one stone? The night of the sacrifice drew nigh, and the ancestor had managed to lure the waif to the docks. Before she had time to react, the ancestor chained her to the idol, and with a little push, sent the two into the icy waters. His sacrifice paid off. As he walked along the shore, jewels and treasures began to scatter along it. But as with most things when it comes to the ancestor, his sins came back to haunt those around him. After his death, the sea folk began coming ashore, and they brought with them the waif, remade in their own image. She was their queen and their slave. She would lure men and women to their doom attacking the trade ships that provided the town with supplies. But for what purpose? Well, one possibility is it has to do with how they repopulate their numbers. Journals we find scattered around the cove tell a story of how a man was bitten by the pelagic creatures and slowly began turning into one. We don't witness this plague firsthand, but this journal could give us insight into why they are here. The man's flesh became gray and scale-like. His breathing became labored. Soon he began to hear voices calling him to the sea. By the end, he had completely forgotten his human memories and believed himself to always be a pelagic creature. He went so far as to slaughter his companions because he believed they had turned into humans before finally walking off into the ocean. It can be unsettling to think that they were once human, but there's no turning back so it's best to just end their suffering. Their numbers have increased exponentially. Now they stalk the caverns of the cove, attacking ships and outsiders who venture too deep. The common one to see is the grouper, wielding a spear and a rusty cutlass they are capable fighters on land as they are in water. The next are the guardians, whose shields grant them impressive defense and are able to guard the physically weaker members of their army, such as the shamans, whose eldritch magic make up for their lack of health. They are able to produce stress waves that cause damage to our sanity while being able to buff and heal their fellow fishmen. The pelagic creatures also brought their own sea life to the cove. They seem to have domesticated these animals since they fight by their side. 
further proof of a civilization or higher levels of thought. The sea maggots resemble a sea snail, whose hardened shell protects it from all but the strongest strikes. The deep stinger appears to be a jellyfish that has found a way to float on land. These creatures attack with their paralyzing tentacles, allowing them to slowly bleed out their target. And finally, the Unca Majors, large crustaceans whose pincers deal devastating bleed damage. Along with their tidal slam, they can stun our heroes as well. But all these creatures pale in comparison to their true weapon, the Siren. Her main ability is her enchantment. With the Song of Desire, she is able to enthrall one member of our party to fight by her side. In this state, the person sees the Siren as their one true love, and is willing to fight and even die to protect her. Fortunately, the state is temporary, and they will eventually come to their senses, with either no memory of what transpired, or full awareness of what occurred. Her conch seems to be the key to her skills, since she is able to stress our party with it, and some are members of her own army. Some believe the pelagic creatures are on our shore to repopulate their numbers. It would make sense, but there are other possibilities as well. Since the man who turned into a pelagic wasn't even sure why he was on land, perhaps their gods have commanded them to return to the surface. We know they worship one deity named Mother Ocean, but they may have other gods. We find a few statues around the cove of some other eldritch abomination. Perhaps this is their god, and commanded them to return to the shores. We also find one other sculpture that looks familiar. Something that looks like the top of the door. The door to the darkest dungeon. Perhaps the thing underneath the manor was able to summon them to the shores. That perhaps they previously served the thing before it was sealed away. Of course, those relics may not have been from the pelagic creatures. They weren't the only ones to travel through the cove. Back when the ancestor was still alive, he would have his artifacts brought to him from the cove. He hired a band of mariners who covertly brought him shipments of occult trinkets. They would sail all over the world, bringing rare and exotic items. But the mariner's greed got the best of them, as they kept increasing the price of their services and their discretion. The ancestor's wealth had finally run dry, so he gave them an alternative form of payment. Giving them the run of the tavern, the crew enjoyed a night of revelry, and as they slept, the ancestor prepared their true payment. He cursed their anchor, imbuing it with the full weight of his ambition and the contempt he held for the mariners. At the hour of the wolf, the anchor shot underwater, dragging the ship and crew with it. If they screamed, no one heard it. The crew was forever doomed to drown with their vessel, but it was not their end. They managed to return to the surface, a ghost ship seeking vengeance, and their return came with a new title, the Drowned Crew. They began sinking cargo ships, dragging the vessels down into the water with the very same anchor the ancestor hexed. When we face them in battle, the captain still uses his bell to ring out orders to his crew, and they continue to obey, attacking with their fish hooks or summoning the anchorman, who uses the anchor to drag our heroes into the water. In this state, our heroes are unable to move and are only able to attack the anchorman. The crew will also be healed from this action, while our hero continues to take stress and health damage until they are rescued. But what happens to the victims of this crew? Drowned thralls are what remains of the sailors who were attacked by the drowned crew. Their bodies have become bloated from the seawater, and the pelagics have reanimated the corpse with their eldritch magic. 
In combat, they are little more than cannon fodder. And if they aren't defeated in time, they will explode, dealing massive damage to our party. There is one other member of the drowned crew we need to talk about. A unique member. While the rest of the crew is chained together and unable to move individually, this crewmate appears to move freely throughout the cove. The squiffy Gast was once a musician, but the melodies and tunes he now plays bring only death and madness to the listeners. He is an anomaly relative to the rest of the drowned, in that he may have been turned into a drowned after they sunk his ship. Perhaps the crew offered him a pack, similar to the ones they offer our heroes while they're enchained. The Gast is unique in that he will also target a specific hero, the Jester. It seems the two have some sort of rivalry, musician versus musician. Perhaps the Gast sees the Jester's loot and wants to test his skills. Or maybe it recognizes that the Jester's mind is fragile, and music is what previously drove the Jester to a killing spree. Or maybe the two have another connection, something from before the estate? Regardless, it's best to put down the ghast before he drives us insane with his fiddle. The Cove, once a place of secret deals and packs, now a labyrinth and a watery graveyard for ships trying to reach the hamlet. Its various creatures, abominations, and unholy monsters are a threat to our seafaring trade. We must fight back, or risk losing life-saving supplies. So light the protective wards around the area, and bring a sense of calm back to these waters. The flopping fish-like things abhor the warding sigils. Let us claim this place anew. <laughs>